everybody? So yeah, as Bart mentioned, usually I'm back over there, either pouring drinks or managing the show. I've been the talent buyer here for about uh, 13 years, and before that I was, I look sort of like this. I wore really bad hats, really bad print shirts, funny jackets, DJed out of a weird suitcase. Uh, but I also wrote about music for uh, places like SF Weekly, uh, San Francisco Magazine, and even the East Bay Express, where I wrote an article about tonight's DJ, DJ Alpha Bravo, and his three-inch CD record label many, many years ago. Um, and I moved here in around 1990, and that's why I'm wearing ridiculous clothes like this. So I want to start off by uh, asking a, a question. Who here... Show of hands, lived here in the 90s. All right, cool, cool. Who here, yeah, keep them up, keep them up. Who here moved here in the early aughts, before 2005? And the people who were here in the 90s. Everybody who's, yeah, okay, all right, all right. So this talk, here. This is how we danced in the 90s. Um, wow, that's a little fast, too. Um, this talk is for the people with their hands up because they'll remember a lot of the things, but it's also for you guys who probably have never heard of any of these venues. It's about lost venues from when I first moved here in 1990 up until 2005. All right. So it's not going to be one of those speeches. Well, all right. It is going to be one of those speeches where I tell you, oh man, life used to be so much better here. <laughs> not completely though. Uh, because as we know, the coffee was shittier in the 90s. There was no, no bike lanes whatsoever. It's really hard to get a cab, any of those things. So those things are better. But music, music was, at least the music venues were pretty awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm also going to show you maps and charts and, and one giant large man peeing. But that's further, further down the road. Okay, so... Map number one. This is San Francisco, present day San Francisco. All of those awesome, I don't know if you can see their, their guitars, the top of the guitar. Every single one of those is a live music venue in San Francisco right now as we are uh, existing right now. So there's about 40 of them. And these are official venues, licensed, pay taxes, have uh, strip ads in the weekly and things like that. There may be... 20, 20, 25 more that I didn't put on here that are unofficial venues that they are like uh, cafes or art galleries or warehouse spaces. I didn't want to get them in trouble, so I didn't want to put them up here and have them run out of town. But let's, uh, let's just say for our purposes, there are approximately 60, 65 places that you can see live music in San Francisco. This is what it used to look like. Now, it's an approximation of 15 whole years, so it wasn't like this every single year during the 90s and aughts, but you get the idea. There are pretty much twice as many places on this map than on the first map. 116 spaces, that's about 62 official legal places and another uh, 54 illegal places. Not illegal, unofficial places, okay? All right, so yeah, fantastic places, crappy places, everything in between, right? San Francisco had um, had some some places that had shitty bathrooms and horrible sound systems, but they also had some amazing, incredible places. And now I'm going to tell you about some of my favorites. All right, I'm going to start in North Beach, the Purple Onion tonight's drink special. In case you have not had it. Uh, the Purple Onion started in the 60s kind of as a comedy club. Um, people like the Smothers Brothers and Lenny Bruce performed there. But by the time I moved here in the 90s, it was ground central for the garage rock revolution, the revival. Play, people like the Mummies and the Phantom Surfers played there a lot. And it had three things that I love in a music venue. It had a very precarious staircase that led down into a basement. It had this weird 60s retro vibe with, like, Naga Hyde booths. And it had an owner who was totally batshit crazy. <laughs> and for, in their case, it was this guy, Tom Guido, who unfortunately I don't have a picture of, who would sometimes jump 
on stage in the middle of a song and start singing along with the band. <laughs> Or he would just kind of get sick of being there and he would pull the plug and jump on stage and yell, the beer is gone, everyone go home. So you never knew what you, I saw a drummer light their kit on fire there. It's a crazy place. Uh, around the corner on Montgomery was the Club Coco Dream. Yes, all right, I'm glad some people were there. A total dump, like the biggest dump you could imagine. And that was what was wonderful about it. You, as a promoter, could walk in there and say, I can bring 200 people, but we want to like nail holes in the wall with hammers. And they'd be like, cool, bring them in. These pictures here are from a party that I and two of my friends, who are both Calyx DJs, put together. It was called Bardo A Go Go. Uh, we started it. Thank you. I think some people have uh, been here, definitely even performed at it, um, including Lucy Laird. Um, 1997 is when we started, and we thought, oh, nobody's going to want to see a 60s French discotheque, right? Though maybe 100 people will show up. It was packed, packed, and, and such a scene that it still continues to this day, 20 years later, here at Rickshaw Stop. Um, July 14th, come on out. And this uh, also the the coquetry had a very bizarre end where they decided okay we're gonna we're gonna end we're gonna have one last show and somebody said let's get the go nuts and the go nuts thing was that they uh, were a snack band so all their songs had snack themes and they had a gorilla in a snack cannon and he would throw sugary treats in the snack cannon and shoot them everywhere and it totally destroyed the whole place <laughs> uh, if you go around the corner in Chinatown you find the Lipa Lounge. Uh, it still exists to this day, as you can see right there, but what they don't have is shows in the basement like they used to. Um, and this is a, another one of my favorite things. It's tiny little basement, ceiling comes barely over your head, it's got uh, probably a fire capacity of 50 people and there's 100 people tr crammed in there, and you'll have amazing bands like this one, Nick Waterhouse, playing there yeah. in front of you know, 75 people. And this was great about San Francisco at this time. You'd had all these tiny little venues where people could build up an audience and Nick at Waterhouse now plays at like the Fillmore on a regular basis. Um, the Coconut Grove was a very different kind of venue. It was over on Van Ness near Pine, started by this man, Sam Conti, uh, who was pretty much an Italian mobster. He owned, he owned like six or seven, I don't know how many, uh, strip clubs in town. Um, and he decided, oh, I'm going to go legal by starting this 40s-style jazz club. And they put $1.5 million into it, and it was a total boondoggle. It looked amazing, but it was also horribly run. and went out of business in three years. However, uh, I worked for him at one of his strip clubs, so I got to go to the opening night, and uh, not only did I get to see Keely Smith right up close, which was amazing, but I also got to stand next to Willie Brown in the bathroom, and I can tell you for sure that he farts when he pees. I mean, we all do, but he farted a lot when he pees. Okay. If you cross Market Street, you've got the Aero Bar, 6th and Market, and this was the exact opposite of the Coconut Grove. This was it. Again, a total dive, sleazy as all get out. It fit maybe 25 people on the dance floor and uh, somehow became ground zero for the uh, Electro Clash revolution here in San Francisco so that the official after party for the Scissor Sisters show at the Warfield was at this tiny little bar. Uh, also spawned two dance parties that became massive hits at Rickshaw Stop, Blow Up, and Club ID, and helped put us on the map. Over on Folsom around, what, fifth? Yes, we have the Covered Wagon Saloon, which was most famous for Stinky's Peep Show, which was um, garage and punk bands on stage, and then uh, large and lovely go-go dancers in the back. Um, a wonderful place to see, very eccentric stuff. My favorite weekly show was the Jesus Club. It happened every Sunday night. And uh, in, in 1994-95, I came here as a, a pretty shy uh, 
small town boy and walked into this place and people were attaching live leeches to their body for enjoyment <laughs> and um, uh, going on stage half naked and piercing each other in, in like the chairs and the booths. So it was kind of an amazing uh, change from rural Massachusetts. <laughs> Um, this also is a pretty big change. Trocadero Transfer started in the 70s as a gay disco place, uh, but by the 90s was more industrial. You'll see, uh, also had live bands. Does anybody recognize who this is? David Lee Roth, yes, David Lee Roth with, with weird 90s hair, very strange. Uh, this over here being Fugazi. Um, so by the 90s it was kind of more of an industrial place. The bondage of go was there on a weekly basis where you could be whipped and spanked and nipple clamped and then dance to The Cure. Um, my favorite show here was, my favorite show probably of the entire decade was this band Crash Worship. And again, it was like 1994, 95, and uh, I was uh, a blushing lad of a very few years and I showed up and I was like, what is this gonna be? I hear it's crazy. And, and I gotta tell you, it was bonkers. Uh, they had uh, torches walking through the audience. They had fireworks exploding. They had people on stage launching condensed milk, whiskey, um, <laughs> red wine, and, and beer onto the audience. And then everyone was just going crazy. Um, and I remember walking home at like four in the morning with my shirt off, looking down at my arms uh, and seeing this rash forming from all the weird fluids. It's crazy. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> Continuing a theme here. At the Paradise Lounge at 9th and Folsom, uh, you had a lot of local bands, including Green Day here, uh, but you also had a little wackier stuff, including Extreme Elvis. Now, this is uh, from the show that I want to talk about, actually. I was so happy to find an actual show. Uh, we placed the underwear over there or else you'd be able to see his very small penis, like amazingly small penis. I didn't, I mean, a shockingly small penis. So I, maybe we didn't even need that. I don't know, Bart, I don't know. But if you can still see, he's peeing also. I don't know if you can see that stream there. I know, I know. This guy was the best performance artist in 15 years. I mean, it was just, he was scary. He was, I mean, he was thrilling. Like you, he moved in the audience and he would come up behind you and then you'd like jump three feet. He broke bottles over his own head. He drank his own pee. He, he did coke off his drummer's ass. Any, all this stuff. It was crazy. But, but also did amazing, very communal things and would talk about socialism. I don't know, it was crazy. All right. What else? Oh, they want to stay on there. Okay. So um, in this time period, a lot of punk bands were looking for alternative venues where they could play either fruit to people for free or underages. One of them was Warm Water Cove off Tire Beach, where you would just set up your amps and a generator and play until the cops came. And this is an awesome pop band, Sour Patch, doing just that. Uh, also near Dog Patch was the Wear Pad, which was incredible. I'm sure Lucy's probably been there. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was like stepping into a 60s exploitation film. You can just see here, crazy. They had like one of the Easter Island heads, obviously not the real one, um, and just all these lights and everything was just beautiful and bonkers and now it's gone. Uh, this is Spanganga on 19th and Mission. Um, it looks like an art gallery from the outside, which is kind of what it was. They had three rooms. They had an art gallery, and then they had a performance space, and then they had a sex den. <laughs> and then the sex den, they were known for various parties, one of which was called Splosh. Anybody know what splashing is? It's when people roll around in food naked as for sexual pleasure. Crazy. Uh, I did not go to that one, but I did go to Darkness Falls, which is a sex party in the dark where you can't see anything at all. And uh, the idea was, <laughs> Bart, look at Bart. He's just not like this idea. The, the idea, Bart, was that you would get over your, your visual prejudices and that you would be like, everyone's beautiful and hey, this, this person feels great and whatever. That's, that's what 90s San Francisco was like. 
Um, 12 Galaxies, also a wonderful place for quirkier stuff to happen. Kind of the house band on for 12 Galaxies was the Extra Action Marching Band. Has anybody seen them? Okay, cool. Um, still around to this day, but they don't play as much. Um, just one of my favorite local bands ever. This, I think, particular show, I think Brent, my friend Brent, is in the back, and he helped He helped to this show carry a coffin into the club, which then Extreme Elvis jumped out of, covered in blood, and him and the Extra Action Marching Band did uh, Black Sabbath covers. Awesome. Um, that's pretty much it for the, the reminiscence portion. I'll leave you with this one photo of the I-Beam, which was like the crown jewel of the Hate Street music venues, but there are many, many more. Uh, but I don't have time to talk about all of them because we have to, we have to figure, we have to, we have to, <laughs> what is it? We have to figure out like what became of these places. That's, I, I dug all these 116 up and I was like, what, what happened to them all? What happened to the Cocodri? What happened to all these things? Well, I'm gonna tell you in a chart. Here is a list of everything that they became. And uh, so it's 116 places. I don't know if you can see all of these. The biggest one is definitely bars. Um, uh, about 11 of them became live music venues under different names. There's a decent amount of them empty, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of unknown ones. Some of my favorite ones, there's, there's a cafe that is an illegal gambling den. That, that's pretty interesting. Some, a strip club, a uh, check cashing place. Anyway, uh, not a lot of music stuff. So let's break these numbers down a little bit more with a pie chart. Um, so we've got 116 places, right? And we've got only 16.4 is currently has live entertainment or even DJ entertainment or comedy. Not the best numbers. Um, we got food and drink, which is, you know, it's great food and drink and fancy bars, but not maybe as culturally edifying services. There's like a Zumba place, uh, you know, fancy. Yeah, all right. Is, is Zumba bad? I don't even know. Wow. <laughs> okay. Don't do Zumba. Note to self. Um, and then housing. Over there, 16.4. It's it's pretty bleak. Um, if you're if you're into live music in San Francisco, we have wonderful places, but but the numbers uh, from what was to now are pretty bleak. However, um, I was trying to figure out like, well, there's got to be a silver lining in this cloud, right? And and I'm going to point you to the purple slice here. Maybe it's blueberry. We don't know. 15.5% uh, of the spaces are still empty. And that sounds bad, right? Oh, at empty spaces, you know, it, it was a great music venue. Now it's empty. Yes and no, right? Because all we need is somebody with an idea and some cash. And that seems to be what people have here. Um, <laughs> at least some people. Uh, and I'm reminded, I was, I was thinking back, like, well, is, is there is there something to reference here? And I was like, yeah, Jamie Zawinski. Does anybody know who Jamie yeah. Zawinski is? Yeah. Okay, a couple people. Um, Netscape, one of the first five people in Netscape or something like that, cashed out all of his money and took over the DNA lounge and turned it into from a husk into this world-class venue. So, hey, anybody got some money? You don't even need as much as he had to turn one of these wonderful empty spaces into something fantastic. All right, so that's... The end of my talk, these, I, I didn't have time to talk about everything. These are just some of the places that I, that I came across uh, through, through Facebook and through asking people. There's a lot of them, and I'm going to have these online somewhere so you can all uh, peruse this. And, and the maps, too. The maps are going to be very interactive. Um, and that's it. That's it for my talk. <laughs>